The topic of chapter 10 is the muscular system. Now this title is a little vague, but what the book is implying here is that we'll be learning the names, the locations, and the actions of specific skeletal muscles within the body. Now we're not learning all of these skeletal muscles because there's about uh, 600 or so skeletal muscles within the human body. So we're only gonna focus on a select few of those skeletal muscles. So that being said, lab list number 10 is gonna be the major focus of this chapter. And so what I mean by that is that the bulk of the material in this chapter is going to come from that lab list. So on your lab list number 10, there are 38 muscles. And so for, all, uh, for each of those 38 muscles, you're gonna to need to know the muscle name, the location of that muscle as you see it on the lab list, and as well as the muscle action. So that is, what is the muscle doing? What type of movement is that muscle producing when it shortens or contracts? So let's get into it here. So skeletal muscles in general attach to at least two bones and cross at least one synovial joint. So when the muscle shortens or when it contracts, it produces a movement at that synovial joint or at those synovial joints. Uh, in this diagram, for example, uh, we're focusing here on the biceps brachii muscle. So this is the large muscle that's on the anterior part of your arm between your elbow joint, which is here, and your shoulder joint, which is right here. So when this muscle is relaxed here, we can see that the muscle is thin and stretched out, but when it contracts, it bulges and becomes much shorter in the process. And when this muscle contracts, it actually pulls on the uh, this is the radius bone here because it attaches to the radius. And in doing so, when the muscle contracts, it flexes the forearm at the elbow joint. So we have the relaxed configuration here and the contracted configuration of that muscle. Uh, you can see it kind of bulges a little bit, uh, becomes a little bit shorter in the process, and in doing so, uh, flexes the forearm at the elbow joint. So that being said, setting up, this, setting up this diagram, we need to be introduced to a few muscle terms. So recall in my previous slide that I had mentioned that skeletal muscles attach to at least two bones. Now the origin of a muscle is the, uh, the bone that does not move when that muscle contracts. And so notice in this diagram here, this is the origin for the biceps brachii muscle. Uh, the biceps brachii muscle originates on the scapula. So that means that when the biceps brachii contracts, the scapula does not move or it moves very little. So notice in this diagram what it's showing here is the origin of the biceps muscle remains relatively stationary uh, between the relaxed and contracted configurations here. We see that the, the shoulder is not moving when the biceps brachii contracts. So this would be the origin of the biceps brachii muscle. Now, of course, the origin is gonna be different for each muscle. Uh, depending on the, where, where that muscle is located, but the origin in general is the term that we use for the bone that is not moving when that muscle contracts. So that's the attachment point that's remaining relatively stationary when the muscle contracts. On the other hand, the insertion of a muscle is the bone that moves when that particular muscle contracts. So notice again here that we have the insertion of the biceps brachii muscle, which is the, uh, the proximal part of the radius, uh, when the biceps brachii muscle contracts, the radius and the rest of the forearm and hand move when that muscle contracts. So the radius is moving when the biceps brachii contracts, brings the rest of the forearm and the, the wrist and the hand with it. Uh, and so this would make the radius uh, the insertion point of the biceps brachii muscle. Uh, and as I mentioned before, the action uh, is the movement that is produced by that particular muscle during contraction. So one action of the biceps brachii muscle is to, as I've already mentioned, is to flex the forearm at the elbow joint, which we see in this diagram here. So depending on which side of the joint a muscle crosses will determine the type of movement that's created by that muscle when it contracts. If the muscle crosses the anterior side of a joint, it will typically produce a flexion. And if it crosses the posterior side of the joint, it will typically produce an extension movement. Uh, 
Uh, there is uh, two exceptions to this rule here, and those are the knee and the ankle joint. Those are the opposite of these examples, as muscles that cross the anterior side of the knee or ankle joint actually produce extension of the, uh, at the knee or at the ankle joint, and muscles that cross the posterior side of the knee or the ankle joint produce flexions. So in general, this rule applies to most muscles except for the uh, muscles that cross the knee and the ankle joints. Uh, likewise, muscles that cross the lateral side of a joint will typically produce abduction, right? That is, uh, they will move the limbs uh, away from the midline in a coronal plane. And muscles that cross the medial side of a joint produce an adduction, that is, they're going to move that particular structure in a coronal plane back towards the midline. One thing that we see about muscles is that muscles tend to be bulky, especially when they contract, uh, as they tend to bulge when they shorten. So in order to avoid unnecessarily bulk, uh, unnecessary bulk at the joint, uh, because unnecessary bulk at the joint could hinder movement at that particular joint, muscles tend to make use of very thin tendons, uh, as the tendons uh, are much less bulky, so that is less bulk uh, when they cross the synovial joint, but tendons also tend to be more durable than muscle tissue is. So because of the movement that's created at that synovial joint, tendons are better able to withstand the, uh, the potential damage that could result uh, from, uh, from movement at that joint. Uh, and so tendons are better able to resist damage across moving joints uh, than muscle tissue is. And so that prevents uh, a lot of unnecessary muscle injuries. So muscles tend to make use of tendons. So muscles that have the primary responsibility for creating a specific type of movement at a specific joint are called prime movers. And muscles that assist the prime mover are typically called synergists. Um, synergists are quite helpful because they are able to add some extra force to the movement, um, particularly if a joint is moving through a wide range of motion. So you can kind of think of synergists as like a gearing system. So some muscles have, um, some muscles uh, are able to create better forces uh, at particular ranges of motion through that joint. And so, uh, so in this way, synergists can kind of act like a gearing system to provide uh, additional force through a wide range of motion. Uh, and synergists also help uh, to slow down or damp any undesired movements as well. So let's take a moment here and look at some synergists uh, from our lab list. So that is muscles that are assisting one another in their movements, right? So let's start with a group of muscles called the rotator cuff muscle group. And these, uh, there are three muscles uh, that are in your lab list that belong to the rotator cuff muscle group. And those muscles are the supraspinatus. Uh, the infraspinatus, and the teres minor muscle. Uh, there is a fourth muscle in this group called the subscapularis, but it is not on your lab list, so you don't have to pay too much attention to it. Uh, so all of these muscles, all the rotator cuff muscles, have their origin on the scapula, and all of them cross the shoulder joint to insert on the greater or lesser tubercles of the humerus. So they all have a common function to stabilize the shoulder joint so that as they provide added reinforcement for keeping the head of the humerus kind of locked into the glenoid cavity of the scapula but also individually each of these muscles contributes to a different type of movement across the shoulder joint so that as we see that individually these muscles will, will create uh, lateral or medial rotations of the shoulder joint but together as a group as a whole they are all functioning to serve to stabilize the, the head of the humerus inside of the shoulder joint. Looking at another group of synergists, uh, we're moving kind of down the skeleton here. Uh, we're looking at the quadriceps femoris muscle group. Uh, as the name implies quad, this means four, so there are four muscles in this group. They're located on the anterior part of the thigh. Uh, three of these muscles you can see here. Uh, one of them is the rectus femoris muscle. Another one is the vastus lateralis muscle. The third is the vastus medialis muscle. Uh, and uh, there's a deep one to the rectus femoris. It's called the vast vastus intermedius muscle. Uh, I'll show you that one in the next slide since it's uh, deep to this rectus femoris muscle here. So we have to kind of peel away these layers in order to find that particular muscle. 
So all of these muscles have origins on the anterior part of the femur, and they have tendons that extend across the knee joint to insert onto the tibia here. And so when those muscles contract, they function to extend the leg at the knee joint here. So here's the thigh with most of the superficial muscles removed, and so that allows us to see the small vastus intermediate or vastus intermedius muscle uh, and its very long tendon here. So this is actually the muscle up here um, near the O here in the diagram represents the origin of, of those uh, quadriceps femoris muscles. The vastus intermedius muscle is actually a small muscle, but it has a very large tendon that extends down uh, and across the knee joint here. And this diagram also shows a much clearer viewpoint of the vastus medialis here and the vastus lateralis on the lateral part of the thigh. Another synergist group is a group called the hamstrings muscle group. And this is a group of three muscles that are located on the posterior thigh. So they're on the opposite side of the thigh that our quadriceps femoris muscle group is. Uh, the muscles within this group are the biceps femoris muscles, which has uh, the name biceps implies that it has two subdivisions or two heads. It's got a long and a short head. So together those make the biceps femoris muscle. We also see the semitendinosus muscle, this very thin muscle kind of in the medial part of the thigh. And then deep underneath that is a broader, uh, flat, almost kind of feather-like looking muscle called the semimembranosus muscle. So this muscle group crosses both the posterior hip and the posterior part of the knee joint. And so what you will see in your lab list is that these muscles have actions at both of these joints because they cross both of those joints. So that's kind of an important uh, thing to keep in mind is that in order for a muscle to be able to have action at a particular joint, it has to cross that particular joint. So you can imply just by looking at the actions of the muscles, which joints they do and do not cross. So in this case, because the hamstrings muscle group crosses both the hip joint and the knee joint, it has action at that particular joint. So notice uh, if you look back to the quadriceps femoris muscle group, that group of muscles did not cross the hip joint. And so from that, you could see that there was no action at the hip joint because muscles can't produce an action at a joint that they don't cross. Seems to make sense, right? Pretty intuitive, but it's uh, probably something that we all haven't thought about. And so that is, um, that's a good thing to bring to our attention. So back to our hamstrings muscle group. So the hamstrings group functions to either flex the leg at the knee joint or extend the thigh at the hip joint, uh, again, because it crosses both of those joints. Uh, finally, for our synergists, the last of our synergist group is the calf muscle group. Uh, this is composed of two muscles, the gastrocnemius muscle, which is the uh, two-headed kind of superficial muscle of this group, and it's pretty easily seen at the posterior part of the leg. Uh, and the deeper soleus muscle, which is underneath it, the soleus is actually being covered up by it, but you can see part of it uh, sticking out here. Both of these muscles are located on the posterior leg, so that is between the knee joint and the ankle joint. Um, both of these muscles cross the posterior side of the ankle joint uh, through this broad tendon, and they insert or attach to the calcaneus, which is the heel bone. So that means that when these muscles contract, they function to plantar flex the foot. So this is the movement that's produced um, when you kind of push your foot off of the ground to move forward when you're running or walking. Um, so that is gonna be plantar flexion of the foot. So now that we've seen some synergists, let's look at the antagonist muscles. So muscles that produce the opposite movement of a prime mover muscle are referred to as antagonist muscles. And antagon antagonists are typically found on the opposite side of a joint that a prime mover is found. So let's look at a few examples of this from our lab list. Um, first, we have the deltoid muscle, which is the large uh, triangular muscle that's located at the, uh, at the lateral part of the shoulder joint. So this is the muscle that abducts the arm when it contracts. And the pectoralis major is the large muscle that's on the anterior part of the chest. It serves to adduct the arm. And so because these muscles cross the same joint and they have opposite actions from one another, they are antagonists to one another. Same goes with the rectus abdominis, uh, which flexes. This is the large, uh, long muscle that 
is on the anterior part of the abdomen. Uh, it flexes the trunk when it contracts, that is, it bends the vertebral column forward. And the second is called the erector spinae group, which is a group of muscles that extends the trunk and is located on the uh, posterior side of the vertebral column. So when it contracts, it extends the vertebral column and extends the trunk by association. Uh, the biceps brachii, uh, as we mentioned in our diagram uh, a little a uh, few slides back, this is the large two-headed muscle that's on the anterior part of the arm. When it contracts, it flexes the forearm at the elbow joint. Uh, an antagonist muscle to that is on the uh, opposite side of the arm. It's on the posterior side of the arm. It's the three-headed triceps brachii muscle. And the triceps brachii extends the elbow when it contracts or extends the forearm at the elbow joint when it contracts. Uh, we looked at these muscle groups, the quadriceps femoris muscle group and the hamstrings muscle group. As we saw, the quadriceps group extends the leg at the knee joint and the hamstring group being on the opposite side of the thigh and crossing the opposite side of that knee joint causes flexion of the knee joint uh, or causes flexion of the leg at the knee joint when it contracts. Uh, another muscle is the tibialis anterior muscle, which is the, a long muscle that's located at the anterior part of the leg or the tibia. Uh, it dorsiflexes the foot when it contracts, uh, and the gastrocnemius uh, or the calf muscle group uh, are antagonists to the tibialis anterior muscle, so um, they serve to plantar flex uh, the foot when the gastrocnemius or the soleus muscles contract. So in that way, they are producing the opposite action of our tibialis anterior muscle. Okay, so those are some example antagonists. Those aren't, that's not an exhaustive list of the antagonist muscles, but it gives you a good idea of what to look for in that lab list as far as antagonist muscles go. So finally, let's briefly discuss how muscles are named. So some muscles are named for their location. Uh, for example, the pectoralis major muscle. Uh, the pectoralis refers to the, um, to the fact that it's on the anterior chest, and so this is the, the main muscle that's located on the anterior part of the chest. Uh, we also see muscle shape or muscle size is a factor in determining uh, how muscles are named, so like the deltoid muscle. Um, the Greek letter delta is a triangular shape, and the deltoid muscle actually resembles an upside-down triangle. So this is why the deltoid muscle uh, that's found on the lateral part of the shoulder uh, is called the deltoid, because it's triangular in shape. We also see the direction of the muscle fibers, or that is the direction of the muscle cells, uh, determines muscle names. So the rectus abdominis, as I mentioned, is the the long straight muscle that's on the anterior part of the abdomen. Um, this word rectus means straight, and so that implies that the muscle fibers or the muscle cells are aligned parallel and straight to one another. So we see that that is named um, not only for its fiber direction, but also its location as well. Uh, abdominis implies it's located on the anterior part of the abdomen. Uh, we also see that number of origins uh, determines the muscle name. So biceps is a two-headed muscle. Uh, biceps femoris is part of that uh, hamstrings muscle group. And so um, it has two heads, the long and the short head. We also see the triceps brachii muscle is a good example of this because it has three origins uh, and three heads to that particular muscle. Uh, we also see that muscle actions uh, determine the muscle name. So a good example of this one is the flexor carpi radialis. Uh, flexor implies that this muscle flexes. Carpi implies that it's flexing the wrist. And this muscle is located on the uh, in close proximity to the radius in the forearm. And so you can often see that uh, it's not just one of these, uh, it's not only one of these uh, characteristics that uh, determines a muscle name, but often these are combined in several ways um, to give really good details about each muscle. So often you can imply the location of a muscle, uh, the action of a muscle, or even the shape, um, uh, or where which joint that muscle is acting at uh, just from the name of it. So muscle names can often give you very useful information uh, about what that muscle does or where that muscle is located.